So let's begin with a little meditation, motivation meditation. Hmm. It's nice for me also. So let your, your body relax. You can hear some people just still relaxing. Okay. Let your mind relax. And from the very beginning, even if as our purpose in doing this is to try to set a special motivation, even from the very beginning, to think I'm doing this to overcome my adherence to the vision of this lifetime, only thinking about this lifetime, to practice the spiritual path for the welfare of others, to attain enlightenment. And to begin with, start with something very easy to find, the breathing, as we often do. And just watch it as though you're doing it for the first time. Successively letting go of all of the thoughts, your attention to the senses. Just watching that one thing, paying attention to one thing, the movement of air in your respiration. But with a factor of wisdom discriminating wisdom that's recognizing when you're breathing out, when you're breathing in, the end points. And when the mind is somewhat relaxed, bring your attention further inside, withdrawing your attention away from the senses to the heart area, and just watch your mind, one instant of mind watching the nature of the mind, if you can, as we begin to do that.
because of familiarity, more quickly recognizing the clarity continuity of clear light. All the thoughts that come to your mind, all the emotional states are just transitory. Their very presence infers the clarity of the mind, its clear light nature, the fact that it's, the mind does not obstruct the arisal of new thoughts, nor does it embed thoughts within it so that they can't escape or change. Try to go deeper and see if you can sense the continual flow of some thoughts as though subconscious, not really subconscious, but more subliminal, as though fish swimming below the surface of the ice. And even let go of those. your mind is somewhat calm, even refocus on the sense of the body, notice its seeming presence, and again let go of that, recognizing it as just an appearance to your mental consciousness. the sense of an I, an observer, not the body, but somehow seemingly connected with the mind, the controller, experiencer, taster. That too is just an appearance to your mental consciousness. Let go of that. Just fly, dive into the spaciousness of your mind. Let there be just mind.
and thinking how fortunate we are to have at this moment in time, in this lifetime, found a life that has the leisure from unfree states and the opportunities, having met the Dharma and so forth, to actually practice Dharma authentically. How lucky we are. We can create the causes for happiness of numberless lifetimes of our own continuum and begin on the path, if we haven't yet, on the path to full enlightenment, where we can be a resource for all living beings stopping to identify so much with our own body and mind and identifying with the welfare of all living beings. But this life has a duration. It's come about because of causes and conditions which are difficult to create even though it's very valuable, it has a finite duration, a very brief one, that we're heading toward the termination of with every instant. This that seems so comfortable that we have plenty of time, spare time, will end quickly. And it is uncertain if we look at our behavior of this life, even in our most ardent moments of practice, uncertain that we actually practice in such a way as to create the causes for another human re rebirth, the next life, whether there are not other causes that we've created that are not yet purified that can throw us into the lowest, lower realms. The Buddha taught that wisdom, fear, is one of the causes that propels one on the path to take direction, to seek refuge in the teachings of Buddha, with faith in him as an individual who achieved enlightenment, and his followers, the Arya beings, the Sangha, who put it into practice and verified that that is true. But taking refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha and taking their main advice to observe the abstention from negative karma and to try to create virtuous karma that at most can give us a certain sense of security for the next lifetime. It's uncertain what we'll do there, whether we'll use that karma up, the virtue, whether we'll create more non-virtue. And no matter where we're born in cyclic existence, is a rich and famous, is a beautiful, having lots of friends and things that we would seek this lifetime. Security and love, pleasures of the senses. Even if we had those, they wouldn't bring us real happiness. They are understood by the Arya beings as fraught with uncertainty, impermanent, transitory, and even their experience is not real happiness. It's what the Buddha called changeable suffering. Rel relinquishing one's suffering by experiencing something, but the very experience itself is only relief, not real happiness. So the individual of intermediate scope takes that understanding as a basis to 
observe ethical behavior, the higher training of ethics that's based on a sense of renunciation, wanting to escape from cyclic existence, seeing it as like chaff, uninteresting. And on the basis of that developing concentration, because ethics dispels the distracted mind and also develops mindfulness, the prime elements that are necessary for concentration, builds up a store of merit. And that, wis that, that concentration is used to develop wisdom, higher training of wisdom, whose aim is to escape from cyclic existence, that begins to investigate the sense of the I, sees how all of our afflictions arise based on that certainty that the I exists, this ignorant mind of ego grasping, recognizing through first through inference and then later through direct perception its non-existence, its emptiness, Some individuals strive for nirvana. But even there, we're fortunate to have somehow, some, somewhere in the past, in, in this lifetime, have met holy beings and have been fortunate to leave an imprint in our mind to have a greater aspiration, seeing that leaving all other living beings behind, even if we were to attain nirvana, would be somehow selfish. That the, there's a greater goal that can be attained, the Buddha taught, a state of full enlightenment, Buddhahood, by overcoming not just our self-grasping, but our egoistic cherishing of ourself and in the ignoring of others. So seeing our own plight as exactly the same as others who might be angry with us, perturbed with us, and others who are maybe angry at our country or see human beings as sources of food or whatever. All of these beings are exactly the same as us, wanting to be happy, wanting to be free of suffering, controlled by karma and klesha, karma and afflictions. And they've all been kind to us, both in the past, over numberless lifetimes, even when they've been enemies, they've been kind. They've given us the chance to, in the human realm, to experience the fruits of our negative karma, the results of our negative karma, in very minor ways. They're kind because they give us the opportunity to practice patience, to practice generosity, practice love and compassion and bring about our own happiness. So to better understand this path that we're aspiring to tread, to achieve enlightenment for the welfare of others, to develop the factors of skillful means of bodhicitta and the wisdom of emptiness. I'm going to participate in the class tonight, listening carefully, contributing for that purpose of achieving enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings, this being one of the subsidiary steps, collecting merit, Merit is very powerful with that intention.
to think I'm going to listen to the teachings, participate, in order to achieve the omniscient state, in order to benefit all sentient beings. Thank you so much. How thoughtful. He was standing up there all the time not to make any noise. So, if we think of a question, I'm gonna, I forgot your name. In back, yeah. Your name? Pat. Pat. If we think, uh, I want to ben bring benefit to all sentient beings, can we benefit the Buddha? <clears throat> so we make motivation at the beginning. We we tr we want to uh, bring benefit to all sentient beings. We we motivate in uh, before we do any action with something similar to bodhicitta motivation. I'm going to do this action in order to achieve enlightenment for the welfare of all sentient beings. So can we bring welfare to the Buddha? Is the Buddha a sentient being? I'm not sure. Venable, what do you think? Jane? I think that's a good question, too. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't say it was a good question. He just said he didn't know. <laughs> I think he's beyond being a sentient being. What do you think? I think he asked two questions, actually. You asked if he was a sentient being, and then you asked, would our motivation or would we bring benefit to it? Yeah. yeah. First of all, can we benefit the Buddha? Can we benefit, you know, can, like our pujas, we offer our gam padyam or whatever to the Buddha's candy bar, Snickers. Yes. Yeah? Yeah, it must be because the Buddha would bow, it's not separate from the Buddha. Then. So if we're helping sentient beings, it must be helping the Buddha too. Well, someone's already a Buddha. They experience everything as bliss, blissful. So it's not as though we can add some new bliss, you know, like someone, you're kind of feeling down and someone brings home, brings like Omo last week brought me a little pastry, you know, so there's a very sentient being. There was some bliss or some relief that, that I didn't have before. But if you bring something to the Buddha, it's not as though the Buddha has some new pleasure they didn't have before, you know. But if we all have potential Buddhas, and by helping other sentient beings, we're actually helping Buddha because in that way we're all aspects of, we all have these aspects of Buddha potential inside of us. Yeah, the difference between having the potential to be Buddha and being Buddha. Like, for instance, if you go into the, you go into the store, I mean, in some cases, maybe you can say, I have the potential to make a million dollars, please give me this new Mercedes. Maybe in some cases, you know, on the basis of that potential, they'll give, you the, they'll, they'll give you the Mercedes. But in general, you need to have the cold cash, right? There's a difference between having the potential to be Buddha and being Buddha. In, uh, in, the, in the, some of the scholarly traditions, there's a lot of debate about this, in the, you know, about whether just because we have the potential to be Buddha, are we already Buddha? It would be a little bit, from a certain perspective, it would be a little bit ridiculous that we are we were, are already Buddhas, but we don't know it. The Buddha is omniscient and all-knowing and no faults and so forth. So I think my, my teachers have said, well, Jimmy, you have a contribution. What are you going to say? Yeah, uh, would, would it be that, uh, that no, you can't help him with some bombs and so forth, because he's got a um, completely purified aggregates, although he is a sentient being. Okay, there's something there. Uh, was usually it said in the in the scriptures it says that 
the word sattva that's translated as sentient being in some cases. Sometimes sattva means courageous being, like bodhisattva or vajrasattva. Sometimes sattva just means what Tibetans translate as sem chen. Sem is this word that we've learned before that means mind. Chen means having, something that has mind. Um, sen, a, a sentient being is li limited to non-Buddhas. So if someone is a sentient being, they are not a Buddha. Because you might say, well, Buddha has mind, excuse me. It, what it means in the etymology of that when they talk about... Uh, well, particularly the, the, you know, all, all the consciousness aggregates, because we're talking about having mind. You can have a body aggregate, but not have mind, in which case... I'm not sure I'm saying you can't, you can't with the Snickers bar, you can't, you know, help them. <laughs> So anyway, a Buddha is not a sentient being according to the definition in the scriptures. Did you know that? Does it have to do with the realms? I, I mean, I was reading that today and I wasn't mm -hmm. clear on form, formless, and, and, um, and desire realm. Mm -hmm. Does the Buddha exist in the formless realm? Buddha doesn't exist, exist in any of those realms. Those realms are kind of the habitat of our mind streams experience those different realms because of our afflicted karma. The Buddha's, Buddha's transcended all of those. The Buddha's mind... What does mind, it mean by the form? Because it says something about the, the form... Yeah, form and formless realms. The right? form realm had something to do with having reached the fourth stage of meditation or something. The formless was um, hmm, well, beyond that. What, yeah, what we're talk, we, we, that we'll talk again about that. When you okay. develop single-pointed concentration, mm -hmm. Say, for instance, if your aim is uh, in, like practicing in the, in the Theravada tradition, let's say in the individual who's practicing the middling scope of the Lan Rim, practicing, as I was mentioning in the motivation before, the higher training of ethics, and on the basis of that, practicing the higher training of concentration, could call meditation also, and then on the basis of that, practicing the higher training of wisdom. So those are called the three higher trainings. That's what brings about, that's the methodology, those are the techniques that an individual who's following the middling scope uses to achieve nirvana, basically, right? The bodhisattvas practice the six perfections, so a little more within, within the motivation, not just the motivation of renunciation, but with the motivation of bodhicitta, their methodology includes the six perfections, basically actually expanded into the ten perfections, that can bring about the um, all of the factors necessary, the the um, accumulation of merit and the accumulation of wisdom, so that are necessary to achieve enlightenment. So when you achieve, when you're working on concentration, there are different kinds of um, meditative states that you can develop. When you develop what's called shamatha, you've heard of shamatha, no? Or, or what, what's, what do we call it in Tibetan? Do you know? What call it? Single point concentration. Shine, right? Yeah. Single point concentration. Shine is the name of uh, the jewelry company of our center in Italy. Sounds nice in Italian. Shine. Um, if you achieve tranquil abiding, calm abiding, that meditative, that your mind stream is in a sense separated from the delusions of the desire realm in a certain way. They're suppressed because of your concentrated state. Okay? In a sense. Um, to achieve the first concentration of the form realm, the, the, uh, this is just, this is called a is, is kind of like a preparation to that, that, that achievement of tranquil abiding. You have to develop what's called vipassana, worldly vipassana. Not the vipassana where you analyze emptiness. There's two kinds of vipassana. Then we'll talk about it. Even today we'll talk a little bit about the, the, the union of single point of, concept, of tranquil abiding and penetrative insight. So worldly vipassana takes, looks at the lower realm from where one is, where one's state of mind is, sees it as faulty compared to the higher state, 
and analyzing in that way is able to suppress the, and through concentration and analysis is able to suppress the attachment, the delusions of the lower realm. It's called separation from attachment and achieve a state of mind in which one is not, one hasn't ceased those as on the Arya path where you have true cessation, but you have a supp suppression of them due to concentration. So that's, the, those states of mind are called, the, the first ones one encounter are called the first concentration, the Brahma, the Brahma realm, the second concentration, the third concentration, the fourth concentration. There are four, four realms of, of subtlety there where the mind has more and more special abilities like that. In fact, by creating that karma, one creates the, or by doing that, one creates the karma to be born after this lifetime without this gross body, this kind of body, but with another kind of form body that's called a form, form realm body. And the mind is also has that same kind of quality that one achieved in the meditative state in the previous life. That's, from Buddhist point of view, that's how one achieves those states. One could become, be born as Brahma in the future. And uh, in different of these uh, states of the form realm, like some of the arhats, when they talk about non-returners, you remember of the four kinds of Arya beings? Non-returners are, or once returners, that means they no longer, they'll return once or they won't return to the, to the desire realm before they achieve enlightenment. They may achieve, uh, their nirvana rather, they, they achieve it in the form, some of them achieve it in the form realm perhaps. Not everyone, but like that. And even beyond that, there is a state where one can uh, meditate even more profoundly. This is all mundane, it was called mundane uh, vipassana. One can meditate e even on the faults of the form realm and achieve what the Buddha called the formless realm. In, if you were doing that as a human, your body is still here. But you create the karma then in a future life to be born without a form, a gross form aggregate at all. Just the consciousness. And there, there's, according to Tantra, there'd still be some subtle form, but uh, that's called the formless realm. So it can be attained both mentally in concentration, those two states, the form and formless realms, while a human, or maybe some gods, the desire realm can do, perhaps, I don't know. And then, you cre by so doing, you create the karma to actually be born in those realms afterwards. But that isn't necessarily a great place to be without having bodhicitta, without having higher wisdom. Just to be born in those states is like being intoxicated for eons. Mm -hmm. And all one's good karma is used up. It's like when we talk about the eight unfree states, one of them is to be born as a long life god, which is one of those kinds of gods okay so anyway just just i just wanted to throw some sand in your gears okay sorry about sentient beings okay naughty naughty monk yes okay a lot of teachers have told me that i i i said that i've heard the buddhists create no more karma because they are not sentient beings anymore and they said to me no that's not true of course they create uh, karma, they hmm. create karma even in their dreams. So then it confuses me. They create, Buddhas create they karma in their dreams. Karma. I don't know if the Buddhas dream. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if they dream. I don't know if I'm not sure what you heard. Maybe you're talking about the gurus or something. I don't know. Paul but, Murphy, but, uh, they're different. You know, I, I've talked to some lamas about this. Some, there, whether you, you know, there's some debate about what kind of karma the Buddhas create. Buddhas, if the Buddhas create karma, might, maybe you can argue they create karma, uh, they create uncontaminated karma, like, you know, so, but there's some, you have to, you have to check, there's some, some debate about this. Anyway, let's get back to, let's get back to the nitty gritty here, okay? How about, um, I think Bonnie had a question about the, the material of the class, right? right? Mm -hmm. I don't understand um, why 
it doesn't disintegrate and nobody's conceiving of it. Remember, we, we, had, we talked about this one of the first classes, and, uh, and uh, Dorje was quite, who's on vacation right now, was quite vociferous. He was saying, no, it can't be. Um, according to uh, Dharmakirti, the famous logician, and I guess Dignagan, the, the, the sort of the stream of uh, logicians, it's sort of the Glukpa's position, too, that a, a meaning generality, what we are, what we are thinking of is what we might call the mental image. It's not something that you see, but something via which you know things intellectually, right? Conceptually. The way in which one develops that mental image is one in which it, it by its very nature, it's a generality, and generalities have no real tangible, you know, existence. A generality, you know, like, uh, you can point to instances of a horse, but you can't point to the, the generality of horse. I mean, where's, where is the generality horse that you have in your mind? You know, so you can say, well, I see them every day. But those are instances. When you have the whole, this whole theory, if you're interested later to investigate um, in logic, I mean, it's still, it's something, it, it, it's, you don't have to accept that that's the case. Jeffrey Hopkins, uh, this great Buddhist scholar uh, said that he he'd heard sometime that the some some Geshe's would argue in the debating courtyard that the thing that you see, the mental image that you see, is actually uh, changing, and that the other the other scholars' heads would crack in amazement because, in other words, they were they were so stuck on their uh, accepting that this is permanent. But from a certain from the tenets that we're studying here, that's the that's the exam answer. You have to say that if it's a meaning generality, it's permanent because generalities in general are kind of, you might say, metaphysical entities. They, although they can have instances, they can have particular instances of a generality. That's how this, that's kind of the meaning of a generality. A generality is something which, which pervades its many instances. And particularities or instances are something that are subsumed by some generality. But the, the instances themselves, you, you can have some instances that themselves might be generalities, but in general, say, flowers, these, these what are these, peonies? Oh, sweet peas. Sweet peas. These sweet peas are flowers, right? All of a sudden you can say, oh, well there, that's, that's flowers of generality, but here's, here's the generality. No, this is, this is a particular of flower, isn't it? This is not the, the generality of flower. So it's in that sense, when we talk about it, we say that um, the, the mental image of flower, if you just talked about that, that is the meaning generality of flower, has come about through a process of eliminating what is not flower. So it is the opposite of a non-flower. And in that process, it's, it's, it's said uh, that, uh, therefore, that mental image is by its nature impermanent. So it might be that you have a mental image, of, if you see your, a cow walking or your mother cooking eggs, or if you're a vegan, maybe, I don't know, tofu. Um, you might say, well, that mental image is moving. How can you say that it's impermanent? I mean, how can you say that it's permanent? But still, maybe your mental image of mother is one thing, and your mental image of cooking is one thing, and maybe it, there is a, a mental image which is, you know, the meaning generality itself. It doesn't disintegrate moment by moment. The, the, the original thing you said was, uh, how could it, the fact that it comes into existence and then is not there sometime, how could it not how could it be permanent then? But that, that we, we dealt with before, remember? There are some things that are permanent and that are what? Not eternal. Not eternal, that are, uh, what's the word? Temporary. That are kind of, uh, I can't remember a nice technical term for it. You know, they come into existence and while they're in existence they're permanent. Like the, the emptiness of this cup. The emptiness of this cup is permanent doesn't change moment by moment. But it did have a beginning when the cup was made. 
The emptiness of the cup is not some metaphysical thing that exists independent of the cup, as though it's always there. It's its ultimate nature of being devoid of existing the way it appears to an afflicted consciousness. That's what it, its emptiness is. So that reality of it only comes into existence when the cup comes into existence. And while the cup exists, that emptiness exists and is permanent. It doesn't change moment by moment. That's the meaning of permanent. But then when the cup is broken, it falls on the floor or it disintegrates, its emptiness is no longer a phenomena that can be talked about at that time as existing at that time. You can talk about the emptiness of the cup of the past, but if the cup doesn't exist, you can't talk about the emptiness of the cup now. So that cup, go, that emptiness goes out of existence, so, but it was still permanent during that time. And so the existence of the cup is also permanent? Yeah, so the existence, maybe you have to, then you have to, then you start getting, and you have to, also you have to check, because existence, if you just talk about existence, is a generality again, right? And so existence, you, can, you might say, well, that sounds funny, because it's existing, but it's impermanent. So not all, it's a little bit com more complicated, even, even according to these tenets, a little more complicated. But it's worth it. Once we, we're going to try to do a, it's like when you draw, uh, if you draw a picture. I'm not an artist, but I'm told. But I, I and I've tried to visualize some time, and it's a similar process. The most important thing is to get a general outline first of all. If you're drawing a picture, an artist they would draw the outline, and then they would put in the details. So don't worry yet. Even though these details might seem all compelling, and uh, we're we're is it Dan? Yeah, we we're, we were talking earlier. Sometimes the, the mind can get kind of bogged down. Ooh, I got it, that one. I got to figure that out, or else all of this doesn't make sense. You know, it, it, they are important, but uh, those are some of the details. It's kind of like the I don't know the freckle on the face or something. And um, so tr let's try to get the and then go back. You know, go in, investigate them as much as you can. Go back and then look at the broader picture, and then as you understand more later, then you can begin to read and study more. And I'm still, even though I've studied this many times, I'm still reading about this and studying about this and to see what the great logicians of the past have said and to see, according to these tenets, what their viewpoint is. It doesn't mean that that's the ultimate position of the highest philosophical school, but according to the Sautrantika school. Okay, let's let's go on. Let's go, go a little bit further in the, the material. And uh, so, where did we get last time? Were we on page fourteen or thirteen? Yeah, I think we were already. We were on. Uh, did we get up to fifteen? We we're talking about. Uh, First of all, the definition, the, the reason we're going in this direction, there's the definition of a prime cognizer, or pramana. The Tibetans say tsema, like T-S, almost you'd have to say T-S-E, but it's, it would be pronounced, it would be kind of like T-S-A with a little dot above it, because there's no E in it, tsema. The definition of tsema, or prime cognizer, is a new, a new incontrovertible knower. Remember, we talked about that last time. And so on the basis of that, we began to investigate what's the definition of these other, if we wanted to know their, the definitions of uh, direct valid um, prime cognizer, direct uh, and inferential prime cognizer. Those are the two divisions of prime cognizer. There's only two ways that we can know things incontrovertibly, either with direct perception or by an inferential cognizer inferential cognition. And so that's where we began to have the definition of an awareness which is a direct perceiver in order to prepare us later for the def definition of a direct valid perceiver or a valid direct perceiver or prime, let's say prime, prime perceiver. So an awareness which is a direct perceiver is a knower that is free from conceptuality and non-mistaken. Remember that from last time? What do you think? Marcy, did you did you understand this? 
Did we? I was trying to figure out are we on 14 now? Yeah, just at the very bottom. Sorry. Yeah, I've, I've sort of, I do my, it's kind of sort of like, it's useful sometimes that you can find, if you put the definitions in one color, you can find them more easily when you study. Um, actually, this definition is a little bit redundant. There's some words in here that are not needed. Do you know what they are? Do you know, Jen? And this one, the definition of a, of a direct perceiver. A direct perceiver has to be a knower, first of all. Okay, that's, that's needed. Which is free from conceptuality and non-mistaken. Do I need both of those terms? Why don't you need that? If, if something is a knower which is non-mistaken, the, the meaning of non-mistaken here, you're right. You're right. You don't need the words free from conceptuality. That's to eliminate, maybe I don't know what you say, gratuitously some misconceptions of the Vaisheshikas, that there are sense direct, that there is conception and the sense perceptions. Although you don't, you don't need, you don't need to say that. Why would that be covered by saying, if you just said a knower which is not mistaken, how can that exclude conceptual thought? How does that, first of all, the word not mistaken, how does that eliminate, how does that pre preclude something being a conceptual thought? What do you think? Yeah, it's mistaken. The word mistaken here, the way it's being used technically in all these tenets, uh, is that it, something is mistaken about its appearing object. Now, there are sense, sense consciousnesses that are mistaken. Like you can see two moons, or you can see a snow mountain as blue, or something like that. So they would be also not direct perceivers, because they're mistaken consciousnesses. They're mistaken with respect to their appearing objects. The, what appears to them, what seems to be apprehended, is not actually what exists. But also, all conceptual minds are mistaken with respect to their appearing object because their appearing object is a mental image, a meaning generality, and they are knowing the object meant by that, sort of like, say, behind that. They are knowing that object via that mental image, so they mistake the mental image for the object. So they're said to be mistaken. So if you just said a knower which is not mistaken, which is non-mistaken, that would definitely exclude all conceptual minds, and it would include the kind of sense perceptions that are not direct perceptions, the ones that are mistaken with respect to their appearing objects. You know? Because they're not called you know, you know for, instance, for instance, in these tenets, they say, uh, if you were to see a firebrand, you know, you know what a firebrand is? Like a torch swirled around, and things like that. It seems like, you know, to your eye consciousness, that it might appear to be a circle of fire, but there's not an actual circle of fire there. So that would be said to be a mistaken sense perception. That would be a, that would not be a direct perception. Okay, direct perception somehow has to be factually concordant. So that was the definition that we talked about last time. So, but, but the way that we put it here, an awareness which is a direct perceiver is defined as a knower which is free from conceptuality and non-mistaken. So that makes it very clear. And there are four divisions of, of direct perceivers. So this is very important. This, I, I think we, we mentioned this last time. Do you remember what they are? Without looking now. I just looked. So oh, okay. Well, that's good. You'll, if you can remember from five seconds ago. Uh, oh, no, don't look. No, don't look. Yeah. Sense, mental, yogic, perception, and... Sense, mental, yogic. Okay, see that? <laughs> Self-knowing. Self-knowing, okay. <laughs> even even <laughs> five seconds, sometimes it's hard to remember, right? It's good. Um, right. So... Here. So direct perceivers are consciousnesses which are not mistaken about their appearing objects, so they know things directly, they're direct perceivers, 
and they are unmistaken about their appearing objects. So they're somehow very reliable. Okay? They're, the divisions are sense direct perceivers. That we talk about five senses. There are mental direct perceivers. That is, it is possible for the mental consciousness to, to know objects directly. But in the continuum of ordinary beings like ourselves, the instances of <coughs> mental direct perceivers are, are rare. It might be sometime there's some debate about whether dream, Lama Sunkapa indicated in some texts, that dr some lucid dreams where you, you seem to see something so clear to the mental consciousness that might be considered a, a direct perceiver. But in general, in these tenets, um, the mental direct perceivers in our continua, is that the right word for plural of continuum? Continua? Continuum, yeah. So continua, continuum. It's like rhinocerai. I mean, anyway, never mind. I don't know about these things. Um, the instances of mental direct perceivers in our continua are limited to one instant. We'll, we'll mention this in a little while. One instant at the end of a train of thought, at the end of a train of sense direct perceiver. The mental mental direct perception takes place for an instant before you, one has a conception about that. X is the basis for that. And one thought instant in our mind streams can't be perceived. It's too short a time. So it, it is inattentive, or as we said, it, it, it's a consciousness to which an object appears but is not ascertained. Can you give an example of that one? Say, for instance, uh, I see Chris's Cadillac with my eye consciousness. What color is your Cadillac? Gold. Gold. Yeah, I thought it was yellow. Gold. Gold Cadillac. So I see it with my eye consciousness. And at the there there are spurts, we could say trains of sense consciousness that take place. There's a direct perceiver, eye consciousness, I see your Cadillac. Goes on for a certain number of instants. And at the end of that uh, it might be, you know, really, really brief. It's not like it goes on for 12 seconds or something. It might be, you know, just a millisecond or something. At the end of that, I'm not saying definitely a millisecond, I don't know how long it would be, but at the end of that, the mental consciousness has one instant of direct perception, mental direct perception of that. How that happens, I don't know exactly. It's not as though the mental consciousness is knowing your Cadillac directly, but via the, the via the, uh, the the agency of the the eye consciousness. Does it happen at every sense, at, at every seeing, every hearing, every, every smelling? Quick I believe so. At the end of it, the train of every sense consciousness, I believe, according to this uh, Lama Sunkapa's tradition. They're different. You can see they're in, uh, I think, in two of the texts here, in Lati Rubashe's and the Compendium of Ways of Knowing, they mention that there, in India there were three traditions that the philosophers, Buddhist philosophers, believed. Uh, sometimes they, they believed that there was, there was a moment of sense, per, uh, of sense perception then a, me a moment of mental direct perception, then a moment of sense direct perception, alternating. But it's said that, that, that there are various reasons why that's thrown out. And then there are uh, other kinds of ideas about that. Yeah, the idea I have is that What's your idea? the eye sees the, the object, hands it off where the mind recognizes the object, and then the mind floods the information with the um, Internal, uh, Judgments and yeah, well, in, in a sense, it's, there's no contradiction with that. The, we're just talking about the particular point at which mental direct, if there is a mental direct perception at all, because one might might say, well, there doesn't have to be mental direct perception. The mind can still be aware of what has happened, and conceive about it because it's it's sort of like the observer of the sense consciousnesses. But here it's said that there is a moment in the in the continua of ordinary beings like ourselves of a mental direct perception of the objects of sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch at the end of the, of the train, but it goes unattended. It goes, you know, we're inattentive of that. So 
that's what's being meant here in this context by mental direct perception. In, in some other contexts, it can also mean clairvoyance. Clairvoyance is an example of mental direct perception. Um, although it is, uh, clairvoyance is not here categorized because it's not a sense direct perception. It's not a yogic direct perception because yogic direct perception only has three objects. Do you know what they are according to these tenets? Did you read ahead? They only talk about the things that an Arya being recognizes. A yogic direct perception only is in the continuum of an Arya being, realizing either subtle impermanence, uh, gross or subtle selflessness of persons, according to these tenets, because Satrantikas don't talk about emptiness of all phenomena, they just talk about selflessness. So it's not a yogic, a clear voice is not a yogic direct perception, and it's not an apperception, it's not a, a self-knowing perception. So it has to be a mental perceiver. But in this situation, in this context, we're not talking about those kinds. We're only talking about the ones in the continuum of ordinary beings like ourselves. So in general, we don't have examples of direct perceivers, mental direct perceivers. So it's kind of, everything we know in our mind almost is just by, by way of uh, conception, which is kind of interesting. Although we think we, we really know, really know things. So I'll just mention here the other, and then we'll take a little break. Um, so there's sense direct perceivers, mental direct perceivers, self-knowing, you could call apperceptive or, I don't know, some other translations, and yogic direct perceivers. And I'll just mention the definition of the first, a sense direct perceiver is that which is produced in dependence upon, or dependence on, its own uncommon empowering condition, its own indriya, its own sense power, a physical sense power, and two, that which is a knower that is free from conceptuality and non-mistaken. Notice it has two parts, a knower that is free from conceptuality and non-mistaken, and that which is produced in dependence upon its own uncommon empowering condition of physical sense power. Its own uncommon empowering condition means, as we were talking before, it doesn't mean, say the, for the eye sense, it doesn't mean the eyeball. This, the empowering condition is that that allow that matter, that subtle matter, like the rods and cones at the back of our retina, that allow an interface between the consciousness, consciousness coming in, and for it to be able to come in contact with the aspect of what we're seeing. And the definition, we'll go through the, the uh, divisions in a minute, the definition of a sense direct perceiver apprehending form is that which is generated in dependence on its own uncommon empowering condition, the eye sense power, and its observed object condition of form, although you don't necessarily need that, that second phrase, and is a knower that is free from conceptuality and non-mistaken. So that directly is the definition of a eye sense perceiver, or a sense direct perceiver apprehending a visual form. Okay, so let's take a little break and uh, renew, renew your sugar content or caffeine content or water content and we'll, we'll, we'll start in a minute. Everyone all reinvigorated, caffeinated, sugar, zuccerated. Okay. So the first thing to understand is um, what sense direct perceivers are, because those are the those are the main things that we, in our own experience, those are the main sense per the the, mo the main direct perceivers that we have. Because the other, we don't have, we're not Arya beings, we don't have yogic direct perceivers. We don't have instances of mental direct perceivers, most of us. And apperceptive direct perceivers, uh, self-knowing direct perceivers are something which the other, the highest tenets don't even accept. This is just the tenet of these, of the lower school. Uh, so maybe the main thing that we have in terms of direct perceivers, uh, the Tibetan word is ngunsum. Ngun sum 
kind of means, it can also mean directly. In fact, it's said that there are three kinds of phenomena that we can know. Those that are munsum, that means, that we could, in that sense we could call it, we could translate it as uh, manifest phenomena. Manifest phenomena, things that, that uh, we can know directly for the first time without depending on logic or anything. They, they appear to the senses, manifest phenomena. There are another category of phenomena called hidden phenomena. In Spanish we say gokyur. Gokyur, gokyur means uh, that which is hidden or covered. Example of that, subtle impermanence. Even though subtle impermanence is appearing to us, we don't, we don't apprehend it with our sense consciousnesses. And even our mental consciousness, when we think about it now, at most we might have an intellectual understanding of it. We don't have a, uh, we don't have a direct perception of it. And even at first we don't have an inference, an inferential cognizer of it. But we can eventually recognize hidden phenomena, such as subtle impermanence, and selflessness of persons, and emptiness. Those are called hidden phenomena. They don't, they can't be known immediately by the agency of their appearing to our consciousness directly. They have to be first inferred. Inverted? Inferred used with, with, with an inferential cognizer, that is, intellectually we have to understand them first of all. We develop a mental image of them, and then once that mental image has become correct, what would we say? True, correct, factually concordant, we say, duntun, we say in Tibetan, according to the fact, in reality. When the mental image is correct, not just our, some kind of fantasized idea, by meditating on that and developing single point of concentration, that, that uh, hidden phenomena such as subtle impermanence or selflessness of persons or even emptiness, that can be apprehended with direct perception via the agency of direct perception. How, whether it means directly by direct perception, or is a little more subtle, we'll, we'll get, have some nice word games later. We we'll, won't we'll worry about that right now. But, um, so hidden phenomena, the second kind of phenomena. Third kind of phenomena are called deeply hidden phenomena. Shinto gokyur, very hidden phenomena. And phenomena like that are things like hmm, what the results will be of some karmic action you do. Not just that it will bring about, like for instance, you know, we can, we can infer because it's... it's um, only hidden that virtuous actions bring about happiness. You can understand, you, be you can begin to realize that. But you can't realize through logic, through ordinary logic, that, for instance, if I give this penny, I will become in 417 lifetimes in the future, in the universe called so and so in the north. I, could, I will have uh, so many dollars because of this. We, you, there's no way. That, that kind of subtle phenomena, deeply hidden connection between actions and their eff effects, is an example of a deeply hidden phenomena. Also other deeply f hidden phenomena, the qualities, the hidden qualities of the Buddhas, that only the Buddha's minds can know and so forth. Manifest, so these three kinds of phenomena, Manifest phenomena, hidden phenomena, and deeply hidden phenomena are known via different kinds of consciousness. We'll be talking about it uh, later today in the next lesson about inference. Manifest phenomena we know with direct perception. We can know manifest phenomena with direct perception. Actually, you can use inference in some cases, like you can infer there has to be fire but fire is something you can see. You don't have to rely on inference to know that there's fire in the past. You can go up there and look, right? You follow what I'm saying?
but you can infer it. But the, but it, it, when we say manifest phenomena, it means it can be perceived for the first time without reliance on inference. But hidden phenomena have to rely on inference, first of all. Some inferential cognizer, first of all. A mental image that's developed that's based on true reasoning, correct reasoning. And then we can know that validly, and eventually know it directly, like emptiness through that agency. Deeply hidden phenomena have to rely on a particular kind of logic of a reliable person, a, a valid person. Say word pramana. This, this word pramana means valid cognizer. It also just means valid. There's also one of the divisions of pramana was valid persons. And the Buddha is a valid person because the Buddha explained to many people, he said, you know, to someone, some man who came out, I think, oh no, I think it was a woman, <laughs> undoubtedly it was a woman, who came out, gave the very poor people, gave the Buddha some small piece of bread. They were a very, very poor family. And uh, the Buddha said, oh, in the future, uh, you will become a solitary realizer in uh, so many eons from now and uh, attain our hardship. And her husband comes out and says, oh, come on, give me a break. For this little loaf of bread, you give it, you know, you know, you're, you're making this, uh, you know, making up this story, trying to get more, more offerings or something. So only the Buddha can know that kind of connection between individual events and their, their consequences. And uh, there are other things, you know, deeply hidden phenomena that only the, the omniscient mind can know. And the way that we can know them is via the agency of the Buddha explaining. Now you might say, well, how do you know the Buddha's right? Maybe he's just making it up. Maybe he's just, uh, you know, how do you know? Well, you have to first, in, or, in order for that kind of logic to work, to prove, you know, that... Uh, what that, man, that, that woman gave that bread, she would be born in the future as a solitary realizer or whatever. She would achieve that state, rather. She wouldn't be born that way. She would be, achieve that state. Uh, in order to prove that, you have to prove that Buddha is a valid person. And there are ways of doing that, that the Buddha has realized all that is to be realized, eliminated all the faults from the mind. And that's one of the subject matter in the, I think it's the second chapter of the Pramanavartika. The same word, pramana, the uh, semanamdal, the commentary on valid cognition, or commentary on pramana, that which is valid. So it talks about cognition, but also the second chapter talks about valid persons, what, why the Buddha is a valid person. A very, very famous uh, explanation. Okay, so here, direct perceivers are no, are those things that know the manifest, that know the manifest phenomena of our universe. And um, we said, okay, so now, there are three kinds. There are two ways of dividing direct sense direct perceivers. Main, the main direct perceiver we're talking about, first of all, is sense direct perceivers, or the ones that depend on the five senses, right? Isn't the mental consciousness a sense? We talk about the sixth sense. Yeah, it's, you could call it a sense, but here when we talk about sense direct perceivers as opposed to mental, so this means the five senses. So don't, you know, don't think there was some mistake that this mental is not included there for, by error or something. It, it just linguistically is supposed to mean just the faculties that depend on their physical sense powers. Here it says, that which is produced in dependence on its own uncommon empowering condition of physical sense power. It's uncommon because it's, it's exclu or exclusive to that particular sense. The eye, eye sense power, eye, eye faculty, does not act as a vehicle to hear in ordinary beings. Even the ear consciousness happens to divert itself to your eyeball. It can't hear through there. It needs its own uncommon or exclusive empowering condition, the sense, physical sense power, the ear sense power, right? So when you divide sense direct perceivers one way, there are three. There are prime cognizers, or pramanas. There are subsequent cognizers. And there are what? 
Let's bring this here. There are sensor direct receivers to which an object appears but is not apprehended. This is what we could call inattentive perception, like the you know, when you were a kid and you were playing games or something and your mom called you for dinner. You're so in, you know, or uh, you know, you're, you're play uh, nowadays, you see, do you see the kids playing Game Boys? Did any of you grow up on Game Boys? Chris, did you have Game Boys? You're, you're, you're older than that, right? No, I mean, that's... Uh, <laughs> you're a big kid. Now you have Game Boys. Did anyone, anyone young enough to have those things? You see sometimes kids completely, even you say to them, dinner's ready. You know? Do you, do you know? Do you want to talk to him? So, so like, like uh, Linda's, Linda's son, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, and you say something. So there's, to their ear consciousness, as their mental consciousness is paying attention, mainly paying attention to one of the senses, let's say the eye consciousness or the sounds here, it's oblivious of what else is appearing to that sense consciousness. That, that ear consciousness, that kind of inattentive perception, is that a wrong consciousness? Who said no? No, it's not, you're right. It's not a wrong consciousness. It actually is a direct perceiver. Notice it's one of the divisions of direct perceiver. Direct perceivers that know their object, that are not mistaken about their object, are of these three kinds. They can be prime cognizers, or what did we call it here? Valid, I call it prime here. Prime cognizers, subsequent cognitions, or consciousnesses to which a, an object appears but is not apprehended, not ascertained, rather. It doesn't, it can't, you can't recall that you perceived it because the mental consciousness was not paying a sufficient attention. But the ear consciousness was still functioning as clear and knowing and knew that object, perceived that object. But you're, you can't recall it later. Okay? It's like the watch, the watch person in the basement watching all the monitors was, you know, watching someone on one of them and the thief came in one of the other doors, you know completely oblivious. He can't recall it at all because he was his attention was over here. Does that make sense? Okay, so three that, that's one way of dividing up. It was there on the monitor. That's the kind of the example of the the consciousness, the sense consciousness is like the monitor in this case. It was there, but the, sen the mental consciousness, that's why I'm making an analogy to the guy in the basement watching, or the gal in the basement watching the monitors, was not paying attention to that sense, you know, watching the ballet and, and oblivious of something else, or listening to the music and, and uh, oblivious of what's come walking in front of you. you know? Oh no, you know, you know, President Bush just watched by, walked by, but you were listening to your iPod, you know. You're listening to the music or something like that, completely engrossed. Okay. So then it gives examples. The example of a prime cognizer, which is a sense direct perceiver. Example, the first moment of a sense direct perceiver apprehending a form. Okay, well here, form doesn't necessarily have to mean visual form. It could mean, because all of the sense perceivers perceive form in its general, in the general meaning of form. Like form meaning, uh, you know, even sounds are form, and tastes are form, and, and odors are form, and tactile objects are form. So we can know, you know, sense direct perceivers apprehend forms. I hear it could be, maybe it could mean all of them. The first moment of such a sense direct perceiver is called a valid cognizer or a prime cognizer. Okay. The second example of a subsequent cognizer is the second moment or the third moment or the seventeenth moment, however, of a sense direct perceiver apprehending the form. Let's say if I apprehend a blue color with my eye consciousness, the first instant of that is called prime in these in these tenets because it was fresh, it was new. Remember the definition here in the previous page of a prime cognizer. A new, incontrovertible knower. 
So nu eliminates subsequent cognition. So it's like the first instant of that I train of, of uh, consciousness, I direct perception, acts like the engine that pulls along, according to these tenets, the subsequent moments. So somehow those subsequent moments, from this point of view, lack some vibrancy of newness, of freshness. They're, they're, they don't have the same impact as that first instant. The upper tenets say it doesn't matter. That, that is to say, the Prasangika says doesn't matter. But anyway, that's, that was this, this, these tenets made fun of the Prasangika before. Do you remember they said, someone says subsequent cognizers are also, are also prime cognizers. How foolish. How could they say that? Because they don't know something newly. And the the Prasangika would say they don't have to know newly. They just have to know, realize their object to be a valid cognizer of Pramana. And the third... Uh, the example of a sense direct perceiver that is what? An inattentive perception. Uh, that's another way of saying, just a generic way of saying, an awareness to which an object appears but is not ascertained. Ascertainment is this word I mentioned before. It has to do with realized. That is, the mental consciousness, to, to, for something to be ascertained, it has to be able to you have to be able to recall, to, it has to be able to generate a remembering consciousness that you actually perceive that. So the third example of this inattentive perception, this sense direct perception, is a sense direct perceiver apprehending a form in the continuum of a person whose mind is especially attracted to a pleasant sound. So here it sort of sounds like it means vis visible form. Okay, so that's the, you know, this. You're listening, like you're listening to your iPod or you're listening to Beethoven or something, and you're so entranced with it, paying attention to the, I don't know, what it was, the beauty or something, the rhythm, and you're completely oblivious of what is occurring to your eye consciousness. It's not as though your eye consciousness is not functioning. Your eye consciousness is functioning, but your mental consciousness is not paying sufficient attention to induce ascertainment that you saw that object. Okay? You can divide sense direct perceivers another way. That was one way, into prime cognizers, subsequent cognizers, and inattentive perceivers. What's the other way? You're looking right at the page, so you must know. Is it the, what was it? The? Oh, I was, I was flashing back on something. Oh, you were, it, it was inattentive perception. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, that's a good example. Okay. So when, when sense direct perceivers are d divided in another way, there are five sense direct perceivers. Well, apprehending visible forms sounds, odors, tastes, and tang tangible objects. In other words, the five sense objects. Then the definition of a sense direct perceiver apprehending a visible form. So that's kind of the meaning of form here. Is a, a, I'll start with two. A knower that is free from conceptuality and non-mistaken, so that makes it a sense direct perceiver. And that which is generated in dependence upon its own uncommon and powering condition, that is, its own faculty, the eye sense power. And this text adds a phrase, and its observed object condition, a visible form. It doesn't say visible here in the translation, but that's kind of the meaning. I'm still just held up a little by that inattentive one. Yeah. And that if you don't ascertain it, how are you a knower? How is the person a knower? A direct perceiver mm -hmm. of a knower. I mean, like, is it perceived if you mm -hmm. ascertain? Huh. It, it know, knowing, uh, there is a kind of knowing in which the clear, there, an object appears to a clear awareness. The aspect is there. The consciousness is not defective. The consciousness, if paid attention to by the mental consciousness, I would say would be perceived. No, no, no. The consciousness is the 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 act of perception was to be aware. Remember these three words: lo, rikpa, and shepa. Before we said lo meant awareness. Lo, rik, rik meant to what? Know or to cognize. Shepa means to. What, we, what, what was the definite? What was the way of translating? Conscious to be conscious of something. <clears throat> the, 
So the sense consciousnesses can know something. They are knowing. It's but we're maybe we have to augment the way that we think of that word. So <clears throat> this is a very good example how <clears throat> our the way that we use words, the ways that we think of them may prevent us from understanding something. Almost you have to be like like Christ said, you have to be a baby again. What did he say? He didn't say that. What did he say? Be you know you have to be like a little child. You have to be reborn. You know, almost you have to start off, get rid of all of our intellectual uh, preconceptions of what words mean, and see what they mean here. Knowing in this context is a good. This is a perfect example because just as you th as you say, that's something that I'm sure comes to many people's minds. Well, you didn't know it. If you didn't pay attention to it, you didn't know it. But the consciousness is knowing it. But the the, the sense consciousness is knowing it. But the mental consciousness is not paying sufficient attention attention to that, if any attention to it. <clears throat> it might make momentary glimpses of it, but it doesn't pay sufficient attention to be able to induce memory of that. Okay, sort of like the fellow or the gal in the basement looking at the, the things. Uh, or like the, the example in the Wheel of Life sometimes, a monkey looking out the various windows of a house. Have you seen that example when it talks about, was it name and form? You know that one, Clayton? And the, so there's a monkey in the house, and there are various windows, like the five senses, the, out, the doorways to the outer world. The monkey is kind of like the mental consciousness, sort of, so I'm looking out one, it's looking out one, paying all attention out of one, it's oblivious of what's happening at the others. But the windows are still clear. Let's say this, 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 the sight could still, or, this, or, or let's say there's an opening in the door, so the sound could still come in. But the monkey may not be paying attention to that. Our monkey mind. Okay. Anyway, we invest, let's investigate that more. Think about what that means. Extend this format to the other the others, the other sense direct perceivers. So this is a very common kind of thing that <laughs> comes in the pages. Yeah. Do the same thing to the others. So how would you say, what's the definition of a sense direct perceiver apprehending uh, odor? Maureen, what do you think? Sense direct perceiver apprehending odor would be? An allergy. An allergy? Not necessarily. How would you augment this definition for apprehending form? That's simple, right? That which is generated in dependence on its own and the powering, uncommon empowering condition, the? Olfactory power? The, uh, the nose sense power. And its observed object condition, a, or an, odor, or you know, fragrance, whatever you want to translate, and is a knower that is free from conceptuality and non-mistaken. Lati Rinpoche mentions in his uh, commentary that Liz Knapper wrote down here that it, you don't have to say, it, 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 this definition would still hold, it would still be perfect definition without saying it's observed object condition of form or it's observed object condition whatever. It's just all you need to say is its own uncommon empowering condition, the eye sense power or the nose sense power or the ear sense power. The reason it says this is because we, we talked before, there are three conditions necessary for a consciousness to arise. Do you remember what those are? Everyone looks down and looks away. <laughs> I know how teachers must feel something. <laughs> Do you remember, Dan? The three conditions for a consciousness to arise? If I said the empowering condition, the immediately preceding condition, and what's the other one? The ob object condition or the observed object condition. So let's say let's take the example of uh, <coughs> taste consciousness, just so we don't use the eye, eye all the time. Taste consciousness. In order for taste consciousness to arise, is it possible for taste consciousness to arise in a corpse? 
person completely dead, no, no, no doubt about it, one week already, even the yogis are gone, okay? You take, you know, you come and you put a nice piece of uh, Govinda chocolate on the tongue. Does a taste consciousness arise? No. Why not? It's a sense power there, and you've got the object. Dead. Up. Oh, what? Dead. dead. Form dead. Form, form dead. No, the form's not dead. The form, well, I don't know if you say the form's dead. The person's dead. There's no immediately preceding consciousness to act as the, as the basis for a next instant of consciousness, the taste consciousness. So also when you're asleep, if you come up to, did you do that with brother or sister when you were a little kid? Or maybe when you were in, in college fraternity or sorority, you, you tickle someone or you open their eyes, you put some, something on their tongue. Maybe they might actually have some dreams because of that because the, the consciousness is oscillating out. And, and, but with, with, in deep sleep, the consciousness is not there. They're not, there's not the immediately preceding condition. So you need to have an immediate preceding condition uh, of consciousness to give rise to the next instant of consciousness. But the other, two, the other two conditions are also necessary. You can't have an I consciousness without a visual form. Okay. Uh, same thing with the ear, of course. You can't have an ear consciousness without a sound. And ob it's its own uncommon object condition. Yeah. If someone's asleep, you snap your fingers, and they're still, you know, asleep. I mean, sometimes they'll wake up if their consciousness is not that deeply... Sometimes you have to shake. Some people sleep. I remember one of my classmates in, in MIT, Al Hirano, God, this guy could sleep so... I mean, he stayed up for hours and hours, but when he slept, it was impossible to wake him up. We had the freshmen, we had to wake up the upperclassmen, right? I think he was a senior. He was one of those guys, when they, they shot the, uh, the first astronauts to the moon, he was one of the guys manning the computers. He was like this genius. And uh, so it, it, to wake up in the morning, after he finally got... That was one of the jobs. The freshmen had to wake up Pirano. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's really a chore. So even you shook him, you know. It's like his sense, con his his mental consciousness must have been so absorbed in the deep sleep that you know there was no even you, you know. It took a long time. Then he it took you know he was in the shower for, you know, an hour or so, and then many there cups of coffee. Well, if the consciousness is already absorbed, that yeah, when, when a person is dying. So when a person is dying, there's no, no special benefit to say the mantras in the ears after the sense, ear sense consciousness is observed. So it should be before that, you know, when you're, if you're giving, if you're reading the Bardo Todal or something to them, you know. Okay, so you can, you can, uh, and the third condition is the object, well, the three, condi three conditions, the faculty, the sense power, without the sense power, the empowering condition, you can't have the consciousness. So it, it says its own uncommon or exclusive empowering condition, the eye sense power, the eye faculty, or the ear faculty, or the nose faculty, or the, the tongue faculty, or the body faculty. That's one, and its object condition, a form. So that's why it mentions these two things, to, in, uh, but you don't have to say the other condition. Okay, so thus that which is generated in dependence on an ear sense power, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that's easy. With respect to this, you know. I'm sorry, can yeah. I go back just one yeah, yeah. second because I realize I'm confused. Oh, okay. Three mm -hmm. aspects for mm -hmm. something. I don't have What's taste, sense, perception. What's the common empowering condition and the sense power? Like when you're talking about the three things that are needed. You're talking about like the eye sense power, the object, and the mm -hmm. previous moment of consciousness, and then I don't get where the uncommon empowering the, is. That's, that's called it, the, unpower, the uncommon or exclusive empowering condition of the eye consciousness is the eye sense power. That's its own exclusive one. It can't function on the uncommon or exclusive uh, faculty of the ear consciousness, which is the ear, it, 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 you know, even the eye consciousness goes there, it can't see. It has to have its own empowering condition, its own uncommon uh, empowering condition. Uh, also, in a sense, 
they all, uh, when we talk about mental consciousness, mental consciousness has its own uncommon empowering condition, which is what? When we talk about mental consciousness. What's, what's the, let's like say, the sense organ of, the, of eye consciousness is some matter in the back of the eye. Not the eyeball, but some, like the rods and cones or something in the ear, you know, there's some subtle material in there that, that actually the interface between the consciousness that maybe registers the pressure or something, no sound in the nose, there's certain area where there's certain material that acts as an interface, that empowering condition. Tongue, certain areas you can map on the body. What about the mind? What's the empowering condition? Does the mind have a physical sense power? The brain? No, it can know without the brain. The brain, you know, Western science would say, yeah, the brain. Without the brain, you can't know. But that's not the case from a Buddhist perspective at all. Um, the empowering, the, uh, the exclusive or uncommon empowering condition of the mental consciousness or any of the, uh, and, and in a sense, the common <clears throat> empowering condition of the other consciousnesses also, but the, the uncommon empowering condition of the mental consciousness is a previous moment of consciousness. And you might say, well, wait a second, George. You said a previous instant of consciousness was the immediately preceding condition. Remember that? But there... could be two different consciousnesses. For instance, to, th to think about something, the immediately preceding uh, condition might be a mental consciousness, you're thinking, and the, um, I'm sorry, I'm saying, the empowering um, condition might be a preceding instant of mental consciousness, because you're thinking about something. And the immediately preceding condition might be a uh, eye consciousness, seeing, seeing form. So they could be different or they could be the same. Okay, who was asking? It was you were asking? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, the, when it, when it's just saying, it's, the word uh, faculty is used twice there, right? Empowering condition, sense power. Power or faculty or and so it would say indria. So its own uncommon or exclusive indria, the eye indria. It's just, it's just like, so it's its own, so that's the name of, it. the reason it's, it's mentioned twice, the word is mentioned twice, is because that's the name of one of the conditions. When we talk about the three conditions that give rise to consciousness, one of them is called the uh, empowering condition, one of them is called the immediately preceding condition, one of them is called the object, observed object condition. Without all three of them, the tripod of consciousness can't stand. Right. Right? I, I get those three. I yeah. guess I'm getting confused. Where does the eye sense power come in? Which maybe I'm just... It's, it's, it is, let's say, if you put in oh, equal okay. sign, okay. its I own uncommon sense. empowering condition equaling the eye sense power. That's what the comma in that case means. Okay. <clears throat> maybe there should be a semicolon after that so you can kind of see <clears throat> that means, or you could put in parentheses, the I sense power. Okay, sorry. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah, no, it's, four, it's three things. That, it's just like saying, that's it. And, and we'll hear, then you'd have to say five things. It's own observed object condition, and then a form. Right. No, the, well, it's the that form, part. that part, that part makes sense. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay, so with respect to the second, mental direct perceivers, there are two parts, definitions and divisions, that's usually the case here. A mental direct perceiver is, I'll, I'll read the second part first, a consciousness that is an other knower, free from conceptuality and non-mistaken, and that which is generated in dependence on a mental sense power, which is not a physical thing, right? It's a previous instant of some consciousness, which is its own uncommon empowering condition. So here, what's the difference here? The, well, well, one difference is that it's a mental sense power. It's not talking about a sense, a physical sense power, right? It doesn't, doesn't depend on the brain, okay? Um, but here, this thing, other knower, is kind of, kind of curious. What's an other knower? 
Any idea? What do you think, Theo? Other than nowhere. It's not an other. <laughs> when I said, what's an other knower? I had to say, what's another knower? <laughs> like a second awareness? A simultaneous awareness? No, here the, diff- the mm-hmm. distinction is, be- there are two kinds of, another way of dividing consciousness is into other knowers and self-knowers. Because the next one that we're talking about is a self-knowing direct perceiver, right? Self-knowers and other knowers. So, Consciousness, we mentioned this before, consciousness has two abilities. Like say here, here's, here's like say, here's consciousness. Can I say that? Here's like clear, clear knowing, like the space of your mind, right? So an other knower, let's see here, what can I do? Which one do I like best? I like this one. Okay, so, so in your consciousness you have this you have this uh, appearance of flower in the space of your mind, right? And the consciousness that is knowing that object, that, that object is different than the consciousness, is, that's called an, not another, an other knower. It is other knower. It is knowing something other than itself. It is not knowing consciousness. But Remember when we do our Mahamudra meditation at the beginning, I ask you one instant of consciousness to be, to try to recognize what's happening the previous instant of consciousness. Here the idea is a little bit different when we talk about self-knowing. Self-knowing is a, is a quality ascribed by the Sautrantikas and the Chittimatras, Chittimatrans and some of the other schools, but not the Vaibhashikas and the the lowest philosophical school and not the Prasangika. But they say there is a fact, there's a quality of consciousness that is aware of its its own knowingness. It is a self-knower. It is knowing consciousness, not knowing the object. So even though an object might be present, this time, there's blue flower this time, okay. So even though an object might be present, one part of the consciousness has the ability to know another object, let's say the flower. That's the other knowingness of it. One part of the consciousness has the ability to know that it is knowing. But it doesn't know that it is knowing blue, it just knows that it is knowing. That's called a self-knower. Self-knowing or apperception. Okay? Or as one, one professor in Wisconsin, John Dunn, calls reflexive awareness. And you really get carried away if you want to be, use all sorts of nice philosophical terms. I don't know if that makes, any, makes it any clearer to me, reflexive awareness. So here it says, when it's talking about a mental conscious, a mental direct perceiver here, it says a consciousness that is an other knower. So according to this definition, a self-knowing direct perceiver is not a mental conscious is not a mental direct perceiver is it because a self-knowing direct perceiver is something that is knowing itself it is not knowing something other than itself it is knowing its own entity it is a knower that is knowing its own ability to know does that make any sense pardon I feel a lot more than the other So, other knower, self knower. So, uh, but as Lati Rinpoche mentions, also, to a certain extent, you have to, you know, you can argue from some of the school's point of view, self knowers and yogic direct perceivers, self knowing direct perceivers and yogic direct perceivers, are both mental direct perceivers, because they don't have. If you say there are only two kinds of direct perceivers, those that depend on physical sense faculties and those that depend on non-physical mental sense faculties. The yogic direct perceiver doesn't depend on any sense faculty and the, and the self-knowing doesn't depend. Even the self-knower of the eye consciousness, even, e- each of the consciousnesses has its own self-knower. The eye consciousness that's knowing form, that aspect of the eye consciousness, that part of the eye consciousness is called an other-knower, knowing form, is knowing something other than itself. 
within the, the entity of that I consciousness, according to Sartrantanas and Chittimatras and others, there is the ability to know that it is knowing. It is the, the definition of a sense, uh, a self-knower, as we see halfway down the page, that which has the aspect of an apprehender. Actually, the word doesn't say have, but zinnam in Tibetan, rangrik itseni, zinnam means uh, apprehending, aspect apprehender, or zinnam, that which is, whose aspect is apprehending, maybe you could say that. It is, it is, it is just knowing apprehending rather than the apprehended. Another knower is, has the uh, aspect of an apprehended object. Its aspect, what appears to another knower, let's say put, that, put it that way, an aspect is that which appears to a consciousness, the appearance to it. So an other knower, what appears to another knower? An apprehended object, some kind of thing that you're knowing about. Um, a self-knower, or you know, self-knowing, direct perceiver, its aspect is apprehension itself. She says, the aspect of apprehender, or apprehending. It knows that the consciousness is knowing. Okay, so let's just go back further, just above there. It said, when we talked about mental direct perceivers, there are three kinds the same three kinds as there were for sense direct perceivers. There are prime cognizers, subsequent cognizers, and inattentive perce perceptions, or awarenesses to which an object appears but is not ascertained. So this is a little bit, I, 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 let it, I can have some debate with the great Purbachok here. The first two I agree with, his examples. The first, uh, a mental direct perceiver, that's a prime cognizer, the first moment of clairvoyance which knows another's mind. Okay, no problem. Second, a subsequent cognizer, which is a mental direct perceiver. The second moment of clairvoyance, or the third or fourth, whatever, which knows another's mind, no problem. The third, uh, inattentive mental direct perceiver. He says, an example, a mental direct perceiver apprehending a sound in the continuum of a person whose mind is especially attracted to a beautiful form. What do you think? Remember when we talked about mental direct perceptions? Pardon? Sound is a form. Yeah, but here this means vis visible form, right? A mental direct perceiver apprehending a sound in the continuum of a person whose mind is especially attracted to a beautiful form. So I don't know. There might be something here. I think this, to me, this is a little bit perplexing because the sense uh, the uh, say, which would be the inattentive perception of the senses in that case the sound. no you, or the ear. no I'm sorry you're right I'm saying excuse me I'm completely wrong you're exactly right that would be inattentive because apprehending a sound it's apprehending the sound but the person is especially attracted to a beautiful visible form. So, a mental direct perceiver, in any case, if it's apprehending a sound, it's going to be inattentive anyway, my point, right? It doesn't matter whether the, whether, because it only lasts for an instant. It only lasts for, lasts for one shortest instant. So that's my, my debate with the <laughs> great Prabhupada. Excuse me, Prabhupada. You know, you, when you debate with your, your teachers, it said you can, debate, you can debate with your teachers, but you always have to be very respectful. Sometimes, though, in the lamas, sometimes, I think some of the mis unfortunate circumstances that hurt, happened to some lamas, it said, when they got carried away and they were debating with their gurus or the Buddha or something, and they, you know, even though the, the the gurus require you know ask us to debate and so forth, but if they got disrespectful, so they, you know, so that's why I say, Prabhupada, excuse me.
So we should debate with Lama Zopa or something. He, he would he would loves that, but you should for your own karma don't become disrespectful. So then I'll just mention these other two. The third, self knowing direct perceivers. So definition a self knower is that which here it says has the aspect of an apprehender. It's kind of hard to render into English. Uh, aspect is apprehending maybe or aspect apprehend it doesn't mean ap it doesn't mean it's apprehending an aspect it means its aspect is apprehension it's knowing apprehension rather than knowing some other object other than itself and the definition of a self-knowing direct perceiver is that's just a self-knower in general that which is the aspect of an apprehender is free from conceptuality and is non-mistaken. So you can divide this up into three kinds. Prime cognizers, subsequent cognizers, and awarenesses to which an object appears but is not ascertained. First two are easy. The third one, this is kind of, maybe this threw you for a loop. Did you understand this third example? Did you read this, Bonnie? Examples of the third. So we're talking about self-knower. Mental it was a self-knower doesn't have to be in the mental continuum, but even the even the as Lati Rupeshe said, even the self-knower of an eye consciousness or an ear consciousness is somehow technically kind of a mental consciousness because it's it's it itself, although the the outer consciousness, the other knowing aspect of the eye consciousness depends on the sense power. The the self-knower doesn't depend on the self on the empowering condition, the exclusive empowering condition. Does that make sense? Not to be joking, sense power, does that make sense? Making puns here. Did you follow that? I mean? Say say an eye consciousness, the the aspect of the eye consciousness, the part of the eye consciousness which is an other knower, depends upon the eye faculty, the the physical eye faculty, to know other other things. But the self-knowing part of the con of the eye consciousness doesn't depend for its functioning on the sense power. It's just knowing, knowing. You got it. I don't agree with it, though. Oh, okay. Think about it. No. I'm thinking. A little bit, or I think. It's not thinking. It's knowing. Even in knowing. It first has to see it, to know it, and then the other can start to operate. Chris is also meditating. He's trying to figure out what she's saying. You know. I'm not sure. Anyway, think about that. I just want I just want to introduce the last one before we finish. So here, the or, or let me give the examples. Example of these: a self-knowing direct perceiver to which an object appears but is not ascertained. So see if you can get your mind around these. A self-knower direct perceiver in the continuum of a samkhya. Now, what is a samkhya? Is that a kind of animal or what is that? Is that one of those things with spots in a long tail? Well, that's a kind of philosophical school in India. Did you study Ashoka? Did you study the samkhyas? Sometimes you could translate, I think, as enumerators because they had a system where there were a certain number of this and that. The Samkhya's is still a very famous philosophical school. I think there still exists, some remnant of it still exists in uh, the Vedic philosophy. Tibetan calls Dangchen, having enumeration. Dangchen, Samkhya. So, a, direct, a self knowing direct perceiver in the continuum of a Samkhya that experiences bliss as being consciousness. So, this, the point of this is this the Samkhya's do not believe that bliss is consciousness. What is bliss? I don't mean the girl that used to work in the office. Bliss is a kind of feeling. Bliss is, or, or pleasure, there are three kinds of feelings. Pleasure, unpleasant, and neutral feelings, right? Or sensations. So bliss itself, or pleasure, is conscious, is a conscious phenomena. Even if you, you know, like say for instance, someone, you know, you feel, you know, you feel sad and someone rubs you and you feel bliss, blissful, tactile sensation. 
that is experienced in your tactile consciousness, that bliss. Or you eat, uh, you know, stracciatella ice cream, or, you know, your tongue consciousness experiences some pleasure. That consciousness experiences that. That is consciousness. Bliss is consciousness. Okay? So, some kids don't believe that bliss is consciousness, but since it is, it must be that for the, the, the point is, for them, the self knower in their continuum that's experiencing that is not being paid attention to. It is, it is being inattentive because they don't, they don't recognize that. They're holding strictly, oh no, this is not consciousness. Okay, think about that. Then another example. A self-knower direct perceiving, a self-knowing direct perceiver in the continuum of a Vaisheshika. This is not a Buddhist, this is not the Vaibhashikas, Vaibhashikas, this is the Vaisheshikas. This is another uh, Vedic, or you could call Hindu Vedic uh, school, the Chetakdas, that experiences bliss as being consciousness. Also, they don't accept bliss as being consciousness, perhaps for a different reason, I don't remember. And then the self-knower in the continuum of a nihilist. This doesn't mean like, I don't know, Jean-Paul Sartre or something like this. This is talking about a particular uh, Vedic school called the Charvakas. C-H-A-R-V-A-K-A, -A, Charvaka. The uh, Tibetans call Gyang Penba. Gyang means long distance. Penba means to throw, to, to toss away. So. They toss away, I think the etymology is like, those who toss away liberation a long way. It's like they're completely, you know, out of it. Um, so, the self-knower in the continuum of a nihilist, which experiences an inferential cognizer as being a prom, prime cognizer. What's the point there? Do you get it? No? Do you get it? Was it Amy, did you say? Amanda. Amanda? So a nihilist, or say material, completely, uh, you know, who, who thinks only thing, uh, what I eat and touch is only thing that exists, you know, don't talk to me about atoms, the other side of the moon, you know, liberation, Buddha, come on, you eat, you drink, that's it. Kind of, that's kind of the meaning, right? So in their continuum, uh, a self-knower, which is experiencing inferential cognition, an inferential cognizer, which is actually knowing something through logic, understand, realizing that as being a prime cognizer, to them that's inattentive, because they don't accept inferential cognition as being a valid way of knowing. They think the inference is just, you know, you, you can't know things through inference, you can only know it through the senses, what you eat and taste and you see? So think about those. And then the, the last one, do we have, how much time do we have, Mr. Six more minutes. Six more minutes. Six more minutes. I went to visit, uh, Ashoka was also from the region where my grandma was born in Bohemia. And is now the, che is it now, what is it now, the Czech Republic? Czech Republic. It's changed so many times. I wanted to visit sometime. The definition of a yogic direct perceiver is, and let's start with the second part, an other knower, an other knowing exalted wisdom. So the, the word exalted or exalted knower here is implying that it's conducive to liberation. Another knowing exalted knower in the continuum of a superior, that means an Arya being, that's how they're translating Arya being here, which is free from conceptuality and non-mistaken. You okay, Bonnie? Yeah. And that which is generated in dependence on its own uncommon empowering condition. What's its uncommon empowering condition? Not a sense power, not just in immediately, any immediately preceding moment of, con of, medita of um, consciousness, but a particular, a consci not, uh, not immediately preceding moment of consciousness, not, you yeah. know, not, not dependent on that, anyone, but a meditative stabilization, a particular kind of consciousness, a meditative stabilization, which is how they translate what? Diane, do you remember? Diane? Meditative stabilization, the word you were asking about at the break. Yeah. 
That's what? Meditative. Yeah, what's the Sanskrit word for that? Is that shamatha or? Shamata. No, that's samadhi. Samadhi. Samadhi is general. Like we have samadhi now in our consciousness, but it la it's not with effort. It's not a fully qualified samadhi. Here, you could call it single point of concentration, which is a union of calm abiding and special insight. So here's a kind of samadhi that's not just calm abiding. This is a kind of samadhi which is a union of shamatha and vipassana. Calm abiding is shamatha, special insight, Tibetans say lakton, that is what we call vipassana. Or in, in, in um, Pali you say vipassana, vipassana, vipassana in, in Sanskrit. So, in other words, this is a, a particular kind of sense, direct, a, a particular kind of direct perceiver, a mental, in, in essence, it's a mental direct perceiver, but it's only found in the continuum of Arya beings, and its object has to be, as it says a little bit further here, where does it say? Someone says, its objects have to be um, the, one of the three. It has to be either subtle and permanence, gross or subtle selflessness of persons. Here in these tenets, they don't talk about the emptiness of phenomena. So this only has two divisions, prime and subsequent cognizers. There's no inattentive yogic direct perception. Yoga direct perception that's knowing subtle impermanence or knowing selflessness of persons is never inattentive. It's chugga, chugga, chugga. It's knowing everything directly. And then it gives some reasons for that and it talks about the Buddha's mind, whether it knows things directly. So let's, just for the sake of completeness and so you don't get too exhausted, so you can get home, let's do a very quick uh, dedication, but still deep and profound. I think whatever merits I have created tonight due to the special motivation and seeds of virtue that have are still on my consciousness, consciousness not yet ripened, I can dedicate them all. The act of dedication is wishing very strongly, aspiring that they ripen in the most profound goal, the most distant and profound goal that's beneficial, that is the enlightenment of ourself for the welfare of all sentient beings, so we can overcome all our faults, develop all our good qualities, become a source of inspiration and love and compassion to all living beings, and to lead those individuals that have special karmic connection with us to their own enlightenment, ripen numberless sentient beings that might be ripened, that might be actually enlightened by other Buddhas, but certainly we have the same power at that state of being all Bu as, as any Buddha. And total bliss, total contentment, no depression, no worries. Due to these merits, may I quickly become a Guru Buddha for the sake of all living beings, all sentient beings. So again, here it depends on your concentration, not just to say the words or to think for an instant, but if you can, just as when we rejoice, we try to have a continuity of that to generate a lot of merit. So here to try to, when one dedicates, one tries to hold that with single point of concentration, that aspiration. <clears throat> 